Hey investor friends, I'm Michelle Markey and today I'm going to talk about my key takeaways from a book that came out this year in April 2021 called Richer, Wiser, Happier, How the Greatest Investors Win in Markets and Life by author and journalist William Green. And William Green has been interviewing some of the world's super investors, around 40 of them since the 90s. And in a relatively short amount of time, considering that William Green is probably only around age 52 or 53, he's interviewed so many investors and some of which are no longer on this earth with us like Sir John Templeton or Irving Kahn. So it's amazing that William Green was able to take a lot of essential life and investing lessons and much like in a cookbook, he was able to distill these lessons into delectable nuggets of wisdom that I certainly benefit from reading. And it took me a little bit to get through this book because there were just so many amazing lessons. And there were even some investors that I admire who gave reviews about this book, including Phil Town, who said if he would have had this book, it would have saved him 20 years of reading and studying, and how Guy Spear thinks of this book as an endlessly fascinating classic. So I'm just super grateful that William Green, who's originally from London, England, and now lives in a suburb outside of New York City, has written this book and it's an amazing book that I will not be able to do enough justice to because there's just so much to learn in here and this is not going to be a very long YouTube video. Before I got to read this book, I actually heard William Green give interviews with some of my favorite podcasts like he was on Toby Carlyle's The Choir's podcast as well as on Danielle Town and Phil Town's Invested podcast. So I'm super happy to have first been able to listen to William Green before cementing some of what I read about in his book as he also talked about them in the podcast at length. And I sort of think if I could imagine someone doing a movie on William Green and the lessons in this book, I kind of feel like because both William Green and Paul Bettany are English and they have this accent that's just awesome to listen to, It'd be kind of cool if someone like Vision from the Marvel Universe would play William Green in a movie and talk about learning all of these investing lessons from some of the greatest of all time. And what do you think? Did you read this book? And do you imagine who could play William Green in a movie if they did a movie about this book? I'm curious to know what you think. And if you enjoy learning about the worldly wisdom of investors like I do, I'd love if you could please like and subscribe because it greatly helps out with the YouTube algorithm and because I'm on a mission to help us be the best investors we can be. Thanks. I'll summarize the prevailing themes that repeat across many of these super investors and what's made them successful in investing and in life. But the main moral of the story is conveniently bookended, literally, the book starts with lessons from Monish Pabrai and ends with lessons from Arnold Vandenberg. And I love how essentially we could distill the main moral of the story of the book to Monish thinking life is a game and not to take it too seriously and to always strive to self-improve and also to arrive at a point of having purpose to enhance people's lives that life isn't about the pursuit of accumulating wealth just for the sake of gathering a lot of money, but actually it's to change people's lives just to make it better as the book ends with what Arnold's lessons were. So I feel like that's an amazing way to think of it. So we can summarize it being life is a game and make people's lives better and that's how we'll be a successful investor and person in life. William Green has woven an intricate tapestry of what makes these iconoclasts not just successful investors, but successful human beings as these mavericks stand apart from the crowd. And they have qualities like being an independent thinker and Charlie Munger has always wanted independence or how Monish Pabrai acts like a honey badger and doesn't care what the world thinks. And he avoids meeting with CEOs because they can be kind of salesy and he doesn't want to be influenced by that. And so he goes his own way to arrive at where he thinks he can value businesses based on his own interpretation of what he's read. And then also, it's no surprise to me that a lot of these investors are unemotional, like both Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett are not very emotional people. And this carries throughout many of the investors in the book. And I feel like I relate well 
and I have a similar temperament to these investors because in a similar way, I also scored very low on being emotionally driven according to my true colors personality test. It makes sense to me that my top attribute is orange or being adventurous and my second quality is being green or an independent thinker. So I'd like to think that I'm able to emulate how these investors behave and therefore I'm trying to be as closely aligned to how they're trying to perform well, not only in investments, but also being a good human being throughout life. The following themes and qualities that I cite about these misfits as William Green describes them is by no means comprehensive, but they stood out to me and they include things like how Francois Rochon said they lack a tribal gene as they are willing to be lonely, but adaptable to change as the world returns to its natural state of entropy or chaos and disorder, which I love this theme from thermodynamics as I think it's a perfect way to think about how the world is always changing. And nonetheless, despite the world always changing, these investors are always constantly willing to learn and self-improve and they have principles they stay true to and they hang out with people who are smarter than themselves and then that in turn makes them smarter and then they practice patience by buying something at a price beneath its real value or its intrinsic value and then they hold these assets for the long term and then they have the self-discipline of having an inner scorecard that they live by so that means that they don't get rattled by things that a lot of people value externally, but they live according to their own values and they strive to be useful and of service to humanity. And much like how Charlie Munger has done to succeed in life, he avoids catastrophic mistakes by not being stupid. So trying to avoid life's inanities and asininities is a way to be like Charlie Munger. And then stoicism can help build one's resilience and ability to withstand adversity by controlling our inner selves so that we can survive against inevitably the bad things that might happen in all of our lives. And everyone has suffered and it's so telling the people who are able to thrive after they've experienced some negative things in life, like both Charlie Munger and Monish Babrai and several other of the investors have lived through negative experiences like Monish Babrai has gone through a divorce or Charlie Munger has also gone through a divorce and lost his first child. So to be able to rise from some of these darker times is really key to being able to reach a meaningful and fulfilling life. As well as Guy Spear wrote to William Green saying that even though Monish Babrai likes to talk about shameless cloning, beneath that there's this ferocity, intensity of learning and always focusing on simple singular ideas with that amount of energy so that that's why someone like Monish Babrai has been so successful. And then as well as we should consider the downside risks as well as what could be the upside like what we've learned from Greenblatt and others. And we should always try to be safe with our money and invert the investment case. So I know that this was a theme among also some more investors like Jean-Marie Evelard, as well as Charlie Munger to make sure that we're always trying to be safe and also to fish where the fish are, as well as these investors often did not try to maximize their assets under management or their fees like Nick Sleep and his partner Zakaria. They tended to return capital to shareholders when they had reached their investing limits, which I think is really big of these people to be able to know what their boundaries are as far as how much they're able to invest and to represent their shareholders honorably. And often these investors were just as invested in the funds or the holding companies that they're invested in as much as their shareholders are. So they're always trying to live up to having a fiduciary duty to do the right thing. And a lot of these investors choose not to live anywhere near Wall Street. They choose much more serene environments where they can quietly and calmly do their investing practice, like how Guy Spear lives in Zurich, Switzerland, or how Chuck Ockrey lives in Virginia, where he's surrounded by wildlife like foxes and deer. The chapter on high performance habits especially resonated with me 
because William Green summarizes that the best investors have built a competitive advantage by adopting habits whose benefits compound over time. And this point is also made by a quote from Warren Buffett where he says that a lot of people underestimate the importance of habits until they're in their 40s and 50s. So it's so important to develop the right habits when we're young. And there's some examples of this in this chapter, including people like the head of Markel Corporation, Tom Gaynor, who is all about being radically moderate and doing small changes that are sustained over time. And then it leads to being able to do things like reinvesting profits for long-term prosperity. So I think that that's an amazing way to incorporate small habits that might seem incremental and maybe insignificant one day, but built over a lifetime make an amazing difference. Or how people like Laura Garretts and Paul Lonsis are all about reading a lot and then repeatedly learning information about the topic at hand with a maniacal focus so that they can be their own successful investors. And I love how Laura Garrett's also has a non-linear approach to investing and she's traveled the whole world and she splits her time between Kyoto, Japan and Utah and the US. So a lot of admiration for these amazing people who have great habits, as well as how I especially like how Tom Gaynor is very frugal because he likes getting something like 50 miles per gallon to his Prius, even though I'm sure he's a multimillionaire. So these people are just awesome and their habits are all things that we should consider adopting ourselves. I appreciate how William Green stresses the importance of being honest with ourselves and he has a lot of candor about his own behaviors as an investor where sometimes he makes emotional decisions or sometimes he might check his portfolio a lot during times of acute stress like when we had the height of the COVID pandemic and I appreciate how he also touches base with a lot of these investors and how they fare during the pandemic like how Ed Thorpe could foresee something bad really happening so he made sure to prepare all the supplies he was going to need because he's a little bit of an older man and as much as he's a gambling genius he wanted to survive the pandemic so kudos to Ed Thorpe for being not only a great investor but also a really smart human who wanted to preserve his family's health and then with William Green I like how he shares what some of his adventures have been in his investment so he was forthright in sharing how he has three stocks and two index funds and one value-oriented hedge fund that he owns which I think is aquamarine capital by Guy Spear and I don't know what his two index funds are but he says his three stocks include Berkshire Hathaway, Saritage, and one mining and property company whose name he doesn't disclose. I'm a very visual learner and I like knowing what some of these super investors and noteworthy people look like so I can better commit to memory their successful habits so I can be a better investor. And I already knew about a lot of them, but some of them are also new to me. And of course, there were my favorite investors like Buffett, Munger, Pabrai, and Spear. And I also learned about some new people and names I already knew about but didn't know what they looked like, including Laura Garretts and Nick Sleep, Kai Sakaria, both of whom are a little bit camera shy. And then there was Bill Miller, Tom Gaynor, Bill Ruane, Howard Marks, Jean-Marie Evelard, Arnold Vandenberg, Joel Greenblatt, Matthew McLennan, Irving Kahn, Sir John Templeton, Robert Persig, Jason Karp, Mario Gabelli, Ed Thorpe, Francis Chow, Jeff Gundlach, Francois Rochon, Ken Schubenstein, and Will Danoff. And I kind of wish the book was able to go more into details about how Will Danoff and Guy Spear approach their investing techniques because I think that among what William Green was able to share from the perspectives of Danoff and Spear that they also have a lot of key insights that I'd love to learn more about. So maybe I'll just Google them some more and learn about some of their key investing lessons as well. There are so many more sagacious lessons I wish I could have touched on today, but maybe I'll do a future video on more of what I've learned after rereading the book and having a chance to internalize the lessons because this book is just so good. Like it's probably now part of my top six of life-changing investing books, along with the ones that you could see in one of my videos about the five investing books that changed my life. 
And some of what I'll do next is make a checklist of some of the most important questions and key principles that I know William did a great job of outlining. Like he would have a lot of important questions italicized or summarize a lot of key principles in bold. So I'm gonna go through each and every one of those things to make sure I understand them well and try to incorporate them into my investing practice as well as I'm gonna leave you with one last set of quotes that I'm gonna borrow from a book title from Howard Marks called The Most Important Thing. And I think that is what Charlie Munger said, which is to take a simple idea and take it seriously. So I'm taking this investing practice very seriously and it's basically not just a hobby, but a way of life for me. So I hope that this initial review was helpful to you. And if you enjoyed my video or learned something, please like and subscribe. And I wish you well on your journey to being the best investor you can be. And make sure that we all care about each other because that's also an important lesson that we learn is that to be a great investor is to care and have compassion for humanity. And I think that that's what truly separates a lot of other people from being great is the fact that we can care. So I wish you well and till next time.